Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks, and this week I had the pleasure of interviewing Adrian Shine. Now, chances are, if you've seen a documentary about the Loch Ness Monster, you would have seen this man and his rather impressive beard show up on the programme. He knows everything there is to know about this uh, myth, this mystery, and I was really intrigued to delve into that and find out what are the main cause of sightings and some of the myths and legends behind this mysterious creature, or is it a creature? We'll, we'll find out in the podcast. But before we do that, we're going to look at the news. So maybe a little bit apt for what we're talking about today, but there's been an actual uh, sea monster attacking boats, and scientists are baffled by orcas that are ramming sailing boats near Spain and Portugal. Now, from the Strait of Gibraltar to Galicia, orcas have been harassing yachts, damaging vessels, and even injuring crew. Now, they've got no idea why these orcas have do it and why they've suddenly decided to start attacking boats. But obviously, these are huge apex predators, not something you want to get on the bad side of. In the last two months, from southern to northern Spain, sailors are sent distress calls about worrying encounters. Two boats lost part of their rudders, and at least one crew member suffered bruising from the impact of the ramming, and several boats have sustained serious damage. Now, there is a small population of orcas in this area, so it's thought that it's the same pod that's harassing these boats. So it's a real mystery as to why they're doing this. Maybe they're just fed up of people uh, mistreating the ocean. Maybe they see us as, as food. Probably not, but you never know. So it's a real mystery. But from one mystery to another, and a slightly older one, the Loch Ness Monster. So I've always been intrigued by this, just because it's so close to home for me, being in the UK... And I've been up to Loch Ness several times and you can't help but stare at it and think about what could be lurking down there. So I had the pleasure of talking to Adrian Shine and he kind of shed some light on this mystery. Well, thanks for joining me, Adrian. Hello. And we we met very briefly Lockside. I don't know if you remember. It was with Chris Conroy a couple of years ago. uh, You were doing some interesting underwater camera work. Yeah, well... Chris has done some fantastic stuff, hasn't he? And um, he's, he's very kindly showed me to some of his little spots, but he's some amazing work there. Um, his, his is excellent on the salmon in the rivers. We started our underwater photography rather earlier, back in the 70s. But of course, it had very specific objectives. We, yeah. were, trying to, we were actually at that, in, in those days, we were actually trying to secure the entire profile of an unusual animal in Loch Mora. <laughs> and um, we were pointing our cameras upwards, silhouette mode. And they weren't very pretty, but they were very effective ah. in terms of covering huge volumes of water. But um, when we came to Loch Ness, we actually began to use underwater television on the bed of Loch Ness and in, in midwater. So our, our sort of photography is a little bit different. Yeah. It involved hours and hours of looking at a screen with nothing on it, basically. Yeah. And, uh, I'm waiting for the occasional fish. <laughs> yeah, well, I can se- definitely sympathise with that because I, I have to scroll through a lot of footage waiting for something to go by, but maybe not to the extent that, that, you've, uh, that you've been doing it. So there's been... Uh, well, what I wanted to start with, basically, have there always been stories of the Loch Ness Monster in the area or is it something more relatively recent? Uh, there's a lot of controversy about when the Loch Ness Monster began. Okay. To begin with, it is a myth that um, people have been reporting prehistoric sorts of animals in Loch Ness for hundreds of years. That's utter rubbish. <laughs> I do think there was a bit of a strange fish tradition or, or horrible beastie tradition at Loch Ness which might distinguish from the more ubiquitous water horse tradition. The, uh, the water horse, of course, was a rather nasty piece of bad news that preyed on travelers. You know, it's a folklore thing. Uh, but when things were seen in Scottish lochs by, by people, which they couldn't account for, they would perhaps tend to interpret it in terms of the water horse. I don't deny that. But there was something a little more going on, I think, at Loch Ness, a little bit before 
um, the, the sensation of 1933. That's when it really began, and that was the first time that anything unusual in Loch Ness was associated with so-called prehistoric monsters. Yeah. So is, is that the same, when you say the water horse, is that the same as the selkie, or is that something different? The selkie is a seal, uh, a, a sort of a seal-human amalgam. Right, okay. The, no, the kelpie is the one. Ah. Uh, the sculpture down uh, down near Stirling has rather hijacked the <laughs> kelpie, because the kelpie was not a nice thing. And what they've done uh, down there is to amalgamate the working horse tradition of Scotland. And though the very occasional Kelpie was magically employed ploughing uh, fields, uh, if you could capture its bridle, I think it was. Right, okay. Uh, it didn't like it. No. <laughs> it didn't like it at all and was likely to take revenge. Wow. So, I mean, you must get asked this all the time, but have you ever had an encounter that's kind of made you scratch your head? I'm not going to say you've seen something jump out and wink at you. But have you ever seen some when you thought, hmm? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, a number of times. But of course, I've been here long enough to have a repeat performance, or by thinking about it, yeah. um, I've been able to come up with a, an explanation of what I was seeing. And of course, that was the original objective of the Loch Ness investigation run by David, the, the Member of Parliament, David James, and Sir Peter Scott in the 1960s. Initially, it was to find out what people were seeing, and I think that was a good idea. In other words, to find the cause of the phenomenon we call the Loch Ness Monster. And um, there's a difference between seeking a cause and being a cause. And sadly, I think the Loch Ness investigation in the end became a cause to encourage belief in the Loch Ness monster based, kindly enough, on human testimony. Uh, there's a lot of human testimony. So there's all, all sorts of parts of the Loch Ness monster are a myth. Uh, the idea of there being similar sightings for hundreds of years. No. What is not a myth is the fact that over 3,000 sighting reports have come from Loch Ness from people who think they've seen unusual creatures there. And so that, has been, that was the objective of the Loch Ness investigation and to, in part it was a part of our own objectives with the Loch Ness project. Although of course our objectives are much, much wider than that. So you've you've spoken to a lot of a lot of witnesses. Do you ever get anyone that you think is kind of blatantly they're just stirring the pot, or do you ever find anyone who's like they've definitely seen something? For the very most part, witnesses are, I believe, genuine. I believe yeah. they are honest and and even sober. By the way, <laughs> that, that's see. very important, isn't it? <laughs> very important, bearing in mind the sort of conventional view. Yeah. Of people who see Loch Ness monsters. They're often very courageous too in, uh, in coming forward because the problem particularly with the media is that you are likely to get a very embellished account even nowadays of what is actually said. On the other hand, uh, photographers, um, certainly most photographs are fakes. Right. And the ones that aren't fakes are probably mistakes. <laughs> Um, the famous surgeon's picture we now know was a, a model. That's the one with the upraised head and neck, you know. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about that. So, what, why you've brought it up? We might as well talk about it. So, it, that's probably one of the most well-known stories yes. about the Loch Ness monster. Uh, well, I say Loch Ness monster. You know, one of the things around it. So, so what is, uh, what's the story behind the surgeon's photo? In 1933, in the final days of 1933, the Daily Mail engaged a rather flamboyant big game hunter called Marmaduke Wetherill, Duke Wetherill for short, to hunt the Loch Ness monster. He was a big game hunter, so why not? Uh, now, he quickly found some footprints on the far, uninhabited, inaccessible side of Loch Ness, some footprints on the shore. And so, plaster casts were taken, and with due solemnity, the box was sealed up and sent to South Kensington, to the Natural History Museum. And people waited with bated breath. They were found to be 
the footprints of a stuffed hippopotamus. Now, <laughs> you could ask what assistance that hippo had had in getting to Loch Ness. Mm, yeah. And um, that rather discredited Mr. Wetherall, who went back, back home and said, well, if they want a monster, we'll give them one. And he spoke to his stepson, Christian Sperling, who was a good, an excellent model maker. And he modeled a monster, I think, on the brontosaurus scene of the recently released film King Kong, uh, early 1933. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he put this on a toy submarine. I think they developed it, particularly with Marmaduke Wetherill's son, Ian. At that point, um, they had a friend uh, called Morris Chambers, an insurance broker. Well, Ian and his father, at least those two, went up to Loch Ness, found a little, little bay where the waves were small, and they could see the other side of the loch. They put the thing in the water, took a picture of it, and then they gave that material to their photographer friend, Morris Chambers. Chris, as far as the model maker, Christian Sperling, was concerned, it was Chambers who actually sent the pictures um, away and dealt with them. But actually, Chambers had, an, had another friend, and that was the surgeon, Kenneth Wilson, a, a well-known practical joker, actually. <laughs> and, um, well, uh, he then took the material that Chambers had worked on because the pictures were taken with a Leica camera. Uh, and then uh, I think Chambers put them onto plates, photographic plates, glass plates. And it was the surgeon who allegedly took the pictures and took them into Inverness for development. In other words, he took, un he took undeveloped plates into the chemist Ogstons. Must have been a shock for the chemist. Uh, well, not much of a shock. In fact, he even asked the surgeon, because the surgeon had asked him to take particular care with them. Okay. And he said, you haven't got the Loch Ness Monster, have you? And the <laughs> surgeon said, well, I think I might have done. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and there we are. It was, initially, the sighting was published in the Inverness Courier, which has a very proprietorial interest in the matter. Yeah. And... Um, uh, subsequently, the picture was published in the Daily Mail, I think the, uh, the 19th of, of April, not April 1st, as has been suggested. No, elsewhere. no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want no. that, would you? But th that's become one of the kind of iconic images, hasn't it now? I know even though it was a, a fake, but that's when, when many people think of the Loch Ness Monster, it normally goes back to that kind of black and white image, doesn't it? It does, it does. Yeah. And, of course, it was written about by the authors of the subject as being genuine, but Constance White in particular and Nicholas Witchell, the a young, um, basically soon-to-be a BBC journalist and yeah. uh, in his book, The Loch Ness Story. Now, both of them had enormously, meticulously uh, misinformed in their writing for the letter of confession sent by the surgeon to Constance White, ah. in which he said it should not be presented as genuine, that it should be presented with a slight doubt, because he was getting a little bit embarrassed about yeah. the whole affair. He tried to step aside from it. But um, he alleged he'd been there with a lady friend who was not his wife. Ah, okay, so the plot thickens. <laughs> and that she might have been responsible for changing the plates ah. for ones elsewhere. So uh, basically, th there is a letter written to uh, Constance White by the surgeon in 1955, in which he says all this. And he even says, by the way, that the creature he photographed, because he did, he, he said that he had photographed something of Loch Ness, Oh, but it was going the other way to the oh. surgeon's picture. And the authors carefully concealed and deleted that sentence. They never mentioned his uh, account of the lady friend, no. or that he had a suspicion it was a fake. 
Um, I think it was his fake, of course. I don't yeah. think the late friends got anything to do with it. But no, uh, no. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, the authors, um, well, did what you might expect journalists yeah. to do. That's fascinating. And so so we, we were hugely misled. The accounts in Constance White and Witchell are meticulously misleading. Yeah. And I was... Um, Go on, sorry, Adrian. Yes, um, we actually discovered the, the, the conspiracy, if you like, uh, when a war correspondent called O.D. Gallagher uh, died. And amongst his papers, I found uh, that he was fully aware, because you see, Ian, the surgeon, the um, Wetherill's son, had actually mentioned this to the Mandrake correspondent of the Telegraph. And uh, he was running a pub at the time in Chelsea of the Cross Keys. And, uh, and it was written up in 1975. But nobody noticed because the picture itself was not published. Nobody wow. twigged it. Uh. But Gallagher, the war correspondent, did twig it. And um, he, he, there was some correspondence over that. But that's what alerted me. And I knew it was genuine because of the name Chambers. You see, Chambers linking to Wetherill, who was, of course, the hoaxer, the master hoaxer. Although the account in Witchell uh, was, in many ways, as misleading as that in Constance White, nevertheless, he let sufficient cat out of the bag to put me onto it because he mentioned that the surgeon knew this Chambers with whom they had a shoot on the Bewley Firth. Anyway, the, the surgeon confessed to many other people along yeah. the way, actually. But uh, it's amazing that it did not become better known. Yeah, it's such a, so, like a, a sordid tale of events for twists and turns. It's like a soap opera almost, isn't it? Well, yes, I think it might be, I call it a conspiracy of confidentiality. <laughs> How is it that the very honest and um, straightforward person, Constance White, wrote such a misleading account? And of course, no less than our present royal correspondent, Witchell, um, had done the same thing. Uh, and indeed said that no flaws had ever been found in the pictures. Well, when you're investigating things, it sometimes happens that people tell you things in confidence. Now, for somebody, it's happened to me. Now, when you are simply investigating something, it is a confidence that you can more easily respect because you are simply using it as information, a tool, if you like, within your investigation. Now, uh, if you're, on the other hand, a journalist, you're supposed to share information. As yeah. an author, you share information, you're supposed to give factual information. So a dilemma exists. There's a paradox there. And um, the surgeon had asked that his confession to Constance White was regarded as confidential. So, uh, and equally, which all it would appear has had, had correspondence with the Major Eglinton, with, to whom the surgeon had also confessed in the, in the mess of a, an anti-aircraft regiment mm. uh, it, during the Second World War. And he wanted the information passed on to the Loch Ness investigation. We don't know whether that ever happened. Uh, the, the thing first came out in 75. Now, Everybody was much concerned then with these underwater pictures that have been taken at Loch Ness by Robert Rhymes. Yeah. And so I think that's why the thing was missed. Sort of overshadowed, you think? It was overshadowed, I think, yeah. and there was yeah. no, no picture published. Yeah. Okay. It's crazy, so, isn't it? And I was reading on the on the Loch Ness Project website that you use the attention of Loch Ness to, as, as a vessel almost for research on large lakes. As you are a naturalist, I know of, you get pigeonholed with, with Loch Ness Monster, but you are a, a naturalist on, on a whole range of subjects. And while not hugely bio, uh, biodiverse, the loch does hold some interesting species 
that we definitely do know live there, doesn't it? Oh yes, and uh, and they're quite fascinating. You know, I've never denied my interest in lake monsters and indeed sea monsters. Yeah, it's fascinating. I was when I was in my teens. Uh, my uncle, um, Leslie Bowers, gave me a book called The Case for the Sea Serpent by Rupert Gould. And um, I've been working through its pages with my travels around the world, um, chasing his sea monsters and the explanations for them. But as a schoolboy, of course, my, my interests initially were birds in a Surrey garden, <laughs> but developed into this um, into this freshwater thing, probably initially stimulated, yes, by by stories of the Loch Ness monster. I read all the books, and um, and went to Loch Mora. But having built a small underwater hide, on the strength of some sighting reports at Loch Mora, which has clear water, by the way, in uh. contrast to that of Loch Ness. Um, of course, I. I was looking at the plankton by the windows and the fish, and they looked at me, and it, my interest diversified enormously to the fish and the, well, in fact, the sediments. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah. For long cores of sediment. But yes, Loch Ness is a fascinating place. Uh, it is not hugely productive on the basis of the nutrients which enter it from very ancient hard rocks uh, which yield very few of the fertilizers for the base of the food chain, the microscopic plants of the phytoplankton. Equally you have this, this quite dense peat stain, brown water, which limits the light for photosynthesis. So that's a, a definite limiting factor to the base of the food chain upon which everything else depends. Um, we did find when we were helping Lancaster University, we see we, we seduce specialist scientists from various disciplines to come and use the logistic facilities that the Loch Ness Project and Loch Ness Center, who are our sponsors, uh, can provide. And so we might say, how do you like some, a tube of mud out of the bottom of Loch Ness? <laughs> well, you be, can't refuse that, can you? <laughs> can't refuse that. If 200 metres down, it's not that easy to get. And um, there are people who look at things like diatoms in cores, or they might look at the little tephras, the glass shards from volcanic eruptions in Iceland. Uh, all these things help to date the material. They might even be looking for isotopes, radioisotopes. So uh, th that's one of the diversi diversifications of, of that I've, I've been through. Yeah. Uh, back to the food and the productivity of Loch Ness. The productivity of Loch Ness may not be great, but of course you can't ignore the migratory salmon and sea trout no, no. which enter the loch and are a bonus to that food chain. They've derived the energy for their development from the sea. So although they might have started life as par, a few grams worth uh, in, in a river, the Sporing River, uh, they will not have been taking resources from the environment for that long. No. They go to sea. When they come back, they'll weigh many kilos. And yeah. uh, that is a bonus. It's sufficient bonus for them to be chased by the occasional seal all the way into Loch Ness. There was one there last winter. Ah, oh, right. Okay. And I, I'm guessing that could be one of the. I, I am gonna. I'm gonna end on that question. So I won't ask you, ask you yet. But I'm guessing that's one of the possible uh, uh, causes of sightings of seals entering the loch. Might have had its play. Its part to play. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Back yeah. In '34, I think. Yeah. Um, one of the, the creatures I do know that lives in Loch Ness that fascinates me are the ferox trout. You know, you heard about those? Yes. You know, yes. ferox real trout. monsters. <laughs> ferox trout, which they used to call cannibal trout, supposed to be big and black. And um, the point about them is you, you tend to find them in what are known as char lakes. Yeah. And they seem to specialise on Arctic char. Now we do have Arctic char in Loch Ness. They're not often caught by anglers, 
but you need fairly specialist gear to get at them and they tend to swim deeper. Um, it's thought, it was thought that they had temperature preferences and they liked it colder. Um, it, I think, is now thought that they're simply more Catholic in their tastes, that they, it's the, you know, that it's the other fish that don't do as well, maybe, in the colder and deeper water. And um, we've, we found two, two definite behaviours, two definite sorts, really. Uh, of char in Loch Ness. The pelagic char, which we call the slimline char, they grow to about 30 centimeters long um, and they are feeding uh, to an extent on benthos around the sides, but mainly on, on zooplankton, uh, the bigger ones, Leptodora, Daphnia, uh, out in the open water. And they're the ones that fall prey to the big ferox trout. The trout that um, have exceeded, I think, 30 centimeters is about the sort of threshold. So the ferox trout, until it gets that long, is probably just eating benthos, you know, um, and maybe even overlapping slightly with the char habitat. But after that, they start specializing in eating fish, their own cousins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they've got some, I've, I've seen some of the stuff that Chris has filmed and they've got, you know, they look predatory. They've got big teeth, they're kind of yeah. almost like a, they're not a pike, but almost pike-like, you know, they are oh, quite- absolutely. Uh, you, you see, the, the, the coarse fish that you might fish in an English river had been, and have been working their way north ever since the, the land bridge, the ice went away 10,000 years ago. And finally, the continental land bridge uh, disappeared as well. So uh, not at all, not all the coarse fish got here, but what did get here, largely because of their migratory habits, the fact that they tended to spawn in fresh water, were the salmonids, the salmon, the trout, the sea trout, and the arctic char. Now, I believe they have uh, radiated to occupy the niches which the coarse fish do further south. And so our slimline trout, uh, our slimline char in the midwater of Loch Ness, swimming quite deep, about 20 meters deep, uh, are fed on by the ferox trout. And they are, these, these trout are serious trout. They, um, <laughs> They will, we've dissected them and they will consume a fish a third of their own length. Wow, that's a greedy um, trout. Yes, exactly. It and is. there's another char, you see, and that one is living 200 meters down on the bed of Loch Ness. Wow. Now, that is not eating zooplankton. No. Some of the, the char we think can move quite quickly up and down, but the ones I'm thinking of are strictly eating the benthos. Now down there, 200 meters down, it's an ice age lost world. Some of the species we have living down there, little chironomid larvae and some of the little bivalves, uh, Pycidia, some of them are really Arctic species. Normally, today you would find them in Arctic streams but they are harbored by the cold water, about five and a half degrees, at the bottom of Loch Ness. Oh, and it doesn't change, you see, uh, throughout the seasons. Yeah, yeah. So they're eating that when they're very small, and there's some very small char down there. But the bigger char down there, now which we've photographed, you know, by the video, as we trawl along with the video camera just above the bed, uh, they are eating each other. So the char, the slimline char of the open water are eating zooplankton and being eaten by ferox trout. But the char down 200 meters down, certainly the bigger ones, if you like, a ferox char. It's a char eat char world. It's a char eat char world. <laughs> and I was looking into some of the more colorful kind of explanations over the years and one of them was apparently circus elephants, I mean you might know more about this, but circus elephants were um, a potential, is that true or is there no evidence for that? Suggested. Okay. It's quite funny really. Yeah. Uh, about the third time it was suggested was um, a chap, um, 
Oh dear me, what a f his name slips my mind, but it came up for the third time. Okay. Um, back in the 80s. Now, the circuses normally came to Inverness by train, uh, but I think it was actually in the year 33 or 4 that I think, I think it was Bertram Mills actually did come by road. And the suggestion was that elephants had been bathed in the loch and swam off and caused reports. There's, there are no photographs and no sightings or sighting reports which in any way describe elephants. Okay. Okay. And they wouldn't be swimming out in the middle of the loch anyway. No. <laughs> the, sorts, the sorts of stereotype sightings you have are multi-humped sea serpent sightings and long-necked plesiosaur sightings. You know, stumpy bodies, four yeah. flippers and a long neck. And uh, those stereotypes, though conflicting, coexist at Loch Ness. Um, no, it's tempting no. because I, I remember seeing an elephant that had got rather angry in a lake near Udaipur in India. And um, after having rampaged through the town with a whole, whole population in hot pursuit, uh, this uh, elephant plunged into the lake and uh, swam by the uh, Piccola palaces. And the, the, the stewards were coming out throwing up the shutters. It was fascinating. Oh. Oh, but you see, you, you've got the hump back and a bit of the head and the upraised trunk. Yeah, so you can and kind it, of see where, where put, they're coming from. It put me in mind of a lake half a world away. Yeah, okay. And so, uh, so it's tempting in a visual sense. Yes, yeah. But I in see. a historical sense, you can forget it. Okay. <laughs> we don't well, even know that elephants were bathed in Loch Ness. Okay, so it's more probably a colourful tale, perhaps. Yes, but yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this last question. I think it's the one that people won't let me get away without asking you, and that is... What's your leading theory then on, on what Nessie could be? Um, well, Nessie is primarily boat wakes. Okay. Uh, the displacement. <laughs> That's going to upset everyone now. <laughs> well, sorry about that. I don't want to spoil anybody's. No, mind, no, no, no. I want this. The truth. It's the truth. <laughs> but um, if you, if you, you know, the point is, the investigators at least have been serious about this. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and yeah, we've been trying to find out what people have been seeing. And the majority are boat wakes, okay. but not exclusively boat wakes. Um, the other, so you've got the multi hump sea serpent. Now, those are boat wakes, both okay. at sea, and you've got to remember that the Loch Ness monster is actually uh, a sea serpent that is confined. That was the conclusion of the first investigator of the subject, Rupert Gould. He'd previously written that book I told you about, The Case for the Sea Serpent, in 1930. And um, he, he, he went to Loch Ness, funded by a marmalade magnate, by the way, um, Keeler, I think the name was, and uh, concluded from the sighting reports and sketches made by witnesses that one of his sea serpents had got into Loch Ness up the river, like the salmon, got confined, <laughs> and that it might be a minimal to identification. And in a way that was true because investigators at Loch Ness, on the strength of the Caledonian Canal, which runs through Loch Ness, um, noted that in calm weather, and it has to be calm weather, the wake, the displacement wake, not the propeller wash, that's not the turbulence immediately behind the boat, that's not what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the bow wave, if you like, fanning out at about 17 degrees either side of the direction of travel. Um, that on calm water gives rise to a series of very solid inky black humps, in other words, a sea serpent, and uh, that is certainly one of the main causes, as you can tell by the sketches made by witnesses. We still have the long neck, of course, but they, my own suggestion for that is water birds, not the ducks, the mallard ducks you might feed in a park, but the longer necked fish eating diving birds 
um, Magansas, and indeed cormorants. Yeah. Uh, sinister, long-necked birds. Uh, the point is this, we perceive size through our perception of distance. But to get distance, we rely partly upon our binocular vision. In fact, I've got two eyes and they're at the front and I'm seeing a slightly different view of everything. And my brain interprets that as distance. But we also have other clues and we look beyond the range of our binocular vision and our eyes are only a little way apart. Beyond that range, there are other clues. For example, familiar objects in the background, boats or something we recognize and know the size of. Um, now, another thing we might use is texture. So if we're looking at short range on a carpet with a pattern, you have a receding perspective of that pattern. In nature, on water, that texture is provided by waves. And therefore, we can get some sort of an idea of distance and hence size. However, when water calms, and especially if there's mist or a haze, for example, uh, and no familiar objects like a, a background, then the scene is devoid of the clues to distance. And that deprives us of our ability to judge size. And um, that's particularly true in misty conditions, but it's very difficult. To, and with, it becomes even harder if you are close to the waterline. Now, the old investigators in the 60s looked for calms because it is overwhelmingly true that both sea monsters, sea serpents, and lake monsters are seen in calm weather. Right. And it was even known as Nessie weather to them. That's when they distributed their cameras, mobile cameras, which sent out along the lock side in a calm. Uh, so that's when, and of course, that is also when boat wakes become prominent. Right. You see, uh, if there are waves, a boat wake, the displacement wake, is often obscured by the waves. Uh, so it's only when you get powered vessels like steamships or motor driven vessels that you can get this effect, or at least the effect is visible. Sailing ships in a calm go nowhere. They are becalmed. Um, as the wind increases, and they move, they do leave a wake. But as the wind increases and they go faster and the wake gets bigger, so the waves are also getting bigger. And so you, it is not prominent, you do not see it. So there we are, uh, <laughs> calm weather you need. Um, yeah. It's helpful to have powered vessels moving through because then you get sea serpent monsters. Uh, again, in calm weather, especially in misty conditions, Water birds have long necks. If you look at the very plesiosaur, you know, the, the prehistoric plesiosaur type of sightings, you will find that the form is actually drawn is actually pretty bird-like. And the behavior described is entirely bird-like, shaking its head, dipping it into the water to perhaps feed. Well, aquatic creatures, fully aquatic creatures, wouldn't be doing that, would they? No, 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 it makes, makes sense. Yeah, what about uh, some of the stories of, say, large eels or sturgeon? Do you think there's any, anything to back those well, up? Well, my favourite is a sturgeon, actually. I'm guilty of that one. Yeah. Uh, you, you've got to remember that for, for us investigators, none of us have actually, our serious, <laughs> serious if rather eccentric chaps, None of us have been looking for plesiosaurs in Loch Ness since 1976. No. Um, or reptiles of any kind. And of course, our recent eDNA study did not find any plesiosaur no, DNA. No, no, that's, that's or good. Or <laughs> any reptile DNA in Loch Ness whatsoever. And we didn't expect it. Um, they did find quite a lot of eel DNA. I'll come on to that. Okay. So basically, we, we're loath to dispense with our fun. 
And so we began to think of things that could cause, or no, or at least could enter unusual creatures, which could enter Loch Ness. It wasn't important to us that it was related in any way to the big sea serpent sightings or the plesiosaur sightings. It's just a question of what big things could get in. Well, seals had already demonstrated that they could and did get in and could indeed have started some of the furore of uh, 1934. But uh, what about other possibilities? Well, my favorite was a sturgeon because they're big. Uh, in the 1950s, the Moray Firth was one of the last refuges of the sturgeon. Uh, in the sometime in the latter half of the 19th century, one was actually caught outside the canal entrance by netting in the salmon nets there. Ah, okay. Of course, were, were so, there in those days. So there is proof they were there then? Oh, yes, undoubtedly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. proof. But funnily enough, there are a few tempting anecdotes. But of course, <laughs> I keep pleading for the scientific method, so I can't use the anecdotes. No, no, of course. No, you need but some people catching. Up. People catching, uh, catching strange fish. There was one chap that um, one of my colleagues, John Mentor, met uh, in Foyers, who recounted a story. His friend, his friend landed a rather strange fish, and his friend remarked that he caught a fucking crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> well. If you, t if you take a look at a sturgeon through water, I mean, it's not dissimilar no. in shape. Big to scales. A crocodile. Yeah, yeah it's got <laughs> these the scutes, the scales. Anyway, that wasn't the only theory, uh, and uh, I, you know, I've certainly not um, not finished on that one. Um, I think it's conceivable that one might have got in and might have had a role at the very beginning of the tradition, which might be a long way back. Yeah, because they do leap, uh, don't they? They will, they will jump out of the water. Uh, yes, apparently sturgeon to in the breeding times, yes. Yeah. Now, and of course, the sturgeon, you see, doesn't eat in fresh water anyway. Not that that would matter, because an individu one individual... Uh, of, however big, might be able to make a living in Loch Ness for a while. Seals do. It could last all, you know, a seal was there all winter. It made a living there then, quite yeah. happily, last year. So, But um, no, sturgeon, of course, exactly like salmon, cease feeding when they come in to spawn. Now, because sturgeon have never been known to spawn in Britain, although there are some speculations about the River Severn, uh, it, they wouldn't find a mate, would they? No. So they'd be disappointed and they'd go away again. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving, and, and if you're looking for something elusive, which of course monster hunters are, then the most elusive creature of all would be one that isn't there. <laughs> and the sturgeon wouldn't be there. So um, the other, the, incidentally, all the theories, the lateral theories that we came up with were fish. Yeah. Different sorts. Um, so, because you see mammals, you'd think would have revealed their, their presence by surfacing and breathing. Uh, reptiles, well, it's far too cold for reptilian reproduction. Uh, amphibians, no salt water ones to enter when the ice melted. Uh, so we came down to fish. And uh, what fun could we have with fish f theorists? Well, I came up with the sturgeon. Uh, Dick Rayner came up with the European catfish, the wells. Yeah. It's an ugly grey fish, and some of the witnesses describe very ugly things. Um, and you get pretty, you know, you don't get much uglier than the European catfish. No, I've seen yeah. them, yeah. He did not suggest they were living in Loch Ness uh, in an indigenous manner. No, he was suggesting that they. Um, might have been introduced by man, as they were by the Duke of Bedford in England, um, in uh, around the catchment of Loch Ness, perhaps, found their way into it. Now, they do not breed until the temperature reaches 20 degrees. And that doesn't happen very much in Loch Ness, uh, maybe in the first inch on a hot, still day. And um, they are very long lived. So he was suggesting that maybe a survivor or two individuals uh, might have um, might have survived in Loch Ness. Uh, 
Yeah. And the third fishy theory was the eel theory, the eunuch eel, the giant eel <laughs> theory. Well, here you see the eel would have entered in plain sight as an ordinary European eel, anguilla, anguilla. And instead of going back to the Sargasso Sea, it would grow huge. I think it was Dennis Tucker, um, an irascible, indisciplined scientist who was thrown out of the Natural History Museum uh, back in the uh, uh, 70s, I think it was. But um, anyway, then you see, the, so the eDNA exercise we did, because our theories had become so lateral, uh, the eDNA exercise could neither confirm nor disprove any of those theories, because taking them in order, my sturgeon would not be there, you know, when, no. we, were taking, when we were taking our samples. You might only get one once in a blue moon. Yeah. But you couldn't deny that you could get one. No, no. So, so much for that. <laughs> now, the, the catfish idea only postulated one or two individuals anyway. And we know from the results, because we took many samples along the whole length of the lock and across it and, you know, top to bottom of it, uh, it was Neil Gemmell's, uh, Professor Neil Gemmell of... Uh, University of Otago. It was his exercise, but we did a lot of the deep water sampling in particular, because we, we do that sort of thing. And um, it, it was clear that actually you did get quite a spatial handle on where things were. For example, there was virtually no DNA of uh, uh, fish, uh, even eels, at the very bottom of Loch Ness. No. But there was an awful lot around the sides. And the only DNA in sub substantial quantities at the very bottom of Loch Ness is actually ours. It's human <laughs> DNA. We, we, we do get everywhere, there are far too many of us. Yeah, we do, we do. And so the, the catfish could not be disproved or, or confirmed on the DNA. There was no catfish DNA found and no sturgeon DNA found. No. As for the eel, well, eel DNA was found, but the theory did not suggest a different species of eel. And no. so even if you did have giant eunuch eels in Loch Ness, the DNA would not reveal them because it would be the ordinary eel DNA. Yeah. So the fun remains. <laughs> and in some ways, that's kind of I know I know people want to want a definitive answer, but in many ways it's sort of the chase, and it's nice to kind of know that there is a little bit of mystery, perhaps maybe different for you because you've spent your life trying to find it all out. But <laughs> yes, well you can you can you can all have fun. You can all join in. Yeah, you it's... see, there is a theory. I think it was Lowenstein who came up with it. It's called the information gap theory of curiosity. Um, people, certainly the, the media, made a big thing of Loch Ness, and um, there is a, a wide casual interest, although only about 17% of people in Britain would actually acknowledge that they think there's any likelihood of there being something unusual in Loch Ness, which is a minority. Uh, but people are still curious. And the theory suggests that we are most curious about the things which seem to be imminently solvable. So it's, it's a bit like sea monsters. Now, the, the sea is a huge place. Um, interest in sea monsters was high in the 19th century, but it's much less now, because the sea monsters are now confined to lakes, both here in Scotland and, and in North America. It's because they're finite. It's because the answer seems close. So when we turn up with a new box of knobs and lights, um, which promises decision, the media come in droves. Uh, they are fascinated, they love it. And because there is the smell of decision and bearing in mind that Proof of the Loch Ness Monster is often in the conventional wisdom thought to lie in photographs, which it does not, by the way. Uh, we've had some recent photoshopped pictures 
and people would always suspect them. But you see, although Loch Ness fulfills one of the criteria of a lost world, it's deep and it's dark and it's cold and it's, you know, a lost world, it's quite big. You could put every human being in Loch Ness on Earth three times, three times over or more. Um, the fact is that um, you can also access Loch Ness. You know, it's quite civilized up here, you know, Inverness, the Highland <laughs> capital is only 14 miles away. You yeah. can drive along, you know, park in a lay-by, eat a sandwich, and you are part of it. it something might pop out. It is mm. imminently solvable. You are literally on the brink of discovery as an individual. So that, I think, is part of the reason it maintains its fascination. Well, look, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you, Adrian, and it's fueled me. Next time I'm up there, when I'm in the water, uh, I'm going to be looking for a huge sturgeon or a unique eel. You never know. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. Well, look, take care. Thank you. That was Adrian Shine shedding some light on the theories and more plausible ideas behind what the Loch Ness Monster is. I think it's great to talk to people who are not just wearing a tinfoil hat. Adrian is a respected naturalist. He knows his stuff behind the plausible reasons. Boat wakes, birds, as he mentioned. My favourite being the sturgeon. I think certainly some of the historical records uh, were, were probably sturgeon. And who knows? You know, there are still a few knocking around. They could very well go up the ness and enter into Loch Ness. But that brings me on to my top five today. Now, a couple of podcasts ago, I did top five things you should have in your camera bag. And that got me thinking, well, what about top five things you should have in your car to do with photography and wildlife watching? Not necessarily just things you should have in your car. That's not really relevant. So I'm going to go through five things that you as a kind of bird watcher slash photographer should have in your car. And the first one is food slash water. I'm going, to, I'm going to sound like I'm obsessed with just eating and drinking all the time. But I mentioned in the camera bag one that you should always carry a little bottle of water. I always have a massive bottle of water in the car because if you've been walking for miles, you just want to chug some water down. Even if it's, you know, like everyone has a bottle of water in their car that's been there maybe a little bit too long. Or maybe I do because my car's a bit of a shithole. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll still chug that down if I'm thirsty or whether it's a flask of tea. And in terms of food... I'll spread various non-perishables around the car. So I always, I always keep little chocolate bars in there. And they might be in there for a few months, might be a bit melty. But if I'm hungry, I'll scoff them down. Breakfast biscuits are a good one. Uh, but you never know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you get a bit peckish, it's really, really handy. Now, cable ties and tape. It's going to make me sound a bit like I'm a kidnapper, but they're, uh, they're pretty decent. If you're out and you just need to join something, you never know the specific needs but I find that electrical tape is invaluable for just sticking bits of kit together or cobbling something together on the slide and maybe a cable tie if you need something a little bit firmer. Say, for example, it might be a perch for a bird that you're going to photograph or something along those lines. Um, similarly, having a knife or a pen knife, if you try to cut something and you don't have a knife, it's just ridiculously hard. I know that sounds really, really obvious, but I, I always keep a little pen knife in the car just in case... I need to cut something or get into something, it can be quite handy. You could even get like a Leatherman or a Swiss Army knife because then you've got multiple things there, but they are really, really handy to have in the car for all kinds of reasons. Do be careful. I did actually end up chopping the end of my finger off uh, by adjusting uh, a bit of camera kit with a pen knife, so I wouldn't recommend that. But, you know, stay safe. Don't play with knives. <laughs> a first aid kit is really, really handy. Uh, again, I mean, like I've just mentioned, you end up chopping your finger off. It can just help you reattach it or at least get to a &E. So first aid kit is really helpful if you end up cutting yourself or I feel like everyone has hand sanitizer on them at the moment. But I always kept a hand sanitizer in my car anyway because I'm always picking up weird and wonderful stuff. And it's just good to kind of clean your hands after you touch that. The final thing and one that's really, really useful is a portable charger. Now you can even get these that are solar powered. So if you are in the arse end of nowhere, you can just put it on top of your car, providing it's sunny, and you can get free power, which is going to be great for charging up your phone, camera batteries, uh, anything like that can be really, really useful. So I find them invaluable when I'm out filming with my GoPros. I can quickly charge up the batteries uh, and use that. So a portable charger somewhere in your car is really good. Again, 
they're all fairly small items, so they're not going to take up that much room in your car, and it's definitely worth thinking about having those in there. So on next week's podcast, I'm joined by Sarah Roberts, and we're going to be talking a little bit about her career working with big predators, in particular sharks. She actually got bitten by a shark, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But also her book, Somebody Swallowed Stanley. And she's going to be talking about the plastic pollution issue. And the book was an idea of really helping kids and and adults understand the issue in a more simplified way. So that's going to be absolutely great. This has been the Bearded Tits podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks, and I will see you next Tuesday. Cheers.